Philippians 4. I preached a lot about warfare and to watch out for the enemy. But then it also came to a point where I believe this is going to be needed to balance it and also that we couldn't forget. This is very important. It's Philippians chapter, four, uh, Philippians chapter 4. I would like to talk to you about a special person that I met. The way that I'm going to preach is kind of somewhat different, just a little bit. But I would like to, for you to meet a very special person. Now this person actually, he went through harder times than I did. Uh, he went through a lot of suffering and trials. However, uh, he was truly happy. And uh, I never really quite understood that. So then uh, I took some time to talk to this person. And then he told me a few tips that I think would be a blessing to you. All right. So I would like for you to meet this special person. His name is Mr. Glad. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Let's see what he has to say here. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased. And I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I can't believe that I haven't noticed it until now, but I... As I go through my verse-by-verse -verse studies in Philippians, I can't wait to cover this chapter. But I think this is the number one chapter for those who wants to receive any positive references or references that give them joy, that is rich with the promises and the blessings of God. It's Philippians chapter 4. Literally, I can't tell you countless sermons that have been done on each and every one of these verses or great teachings that could have been done from each and every one of these verses. It is filled where you can go uh, hours and hours on each verse. Each verse can be one sermon, if not three volumes, just on one verse. But I am going to condense all of these special promises and these great verses into one sermon. And basically, Mr. Glad here, he was speaking to me all these things. And then I got all these wonderful promises and all these positive references from Mr. Glad. And I was like, wow, you know, these are great things I could keep in my life. But sadly, I didn't really keep them in my life. Now, the thing is, why can I not be like Mr. Glad? And not just hearing and just believing, but actually being like Mr. Glad. Not just believing or hearing Positive things from the Lord that can comfort my heart or the special promises that can keep me going or recall all the blessings, but to actually be, be joy itself, be happiness itself and not to just uh, hear about it or then to just try to apply it, but to become it, to be, become it. If there's one thing about Paul, he became it. And that's the reason why he can speak all these things. So I want to learn from Mr. Glad right here, our Apostle Paul. And I want to hear from Paul's mouth, his experiences being Mr. Glad, and I would like to share some of it with you. Amen. One thing I learned is that there are so many false churches today that would tell you that Christianity is a, a spoiled life, it's full of comforts, and that 
Uh, if you pray to God to get a Ferrari, you'll get one if you give a special love offering. And then Joel Osteen got rich from countless books about positive life, positive living, psychology. They have a thing called positive psychology. But the promise with all those things is that they give a positive, uh, they give a positive plane that is not based on the Bible, that does not count suffering and cost, and that is not aware of spiritual warfare or that there is a devil. And the problem with those churches is that they've given that warped mind to these people and they deceive themselves in living a positive life. And because of that, they lived in demon deluded lives, as you have heard in last Sunday's sermon, that they uh, don't think about that there is a devil. And when bad things happen to them, they're like, why do these bad things happen to me when God promised me all these good things in their lives? And then they feel backslidden and betrayed and some of them give up their Christianity. And that's the problem with people today about the positive living in Christianity. But I also want us to know that there is a balance that, hey, um, if you know about pain and suffering, if you know there is a devil, don't stay there. Just uh, know about these things and be aware and armed, but at the same time, don't lose your positive joy in Jesus Christ. And one thing I've learned is that when people keep trying, listen up, when you keep trying to find something bad in life and you use the excuse that, hey, you blame the world on everything, you blame the devil for everything, you get too hard on your flesh about a lot of things and then uh, you try to find something evil and evil, guess what? You will find something evil. And not only that, you will live a life that's full of sadness, hardships. If you keep looking for one, you will get one. But I wonder if you keep trying to look for the good and the beautiful and the positive things that God's just a great God. And yes, we know that there is a devil and we have to be armed and prepare for war. But don't you ever stop to think that life is just too good and that God is so good to you and because of that blessing you receive it and appreciate it and it gives you strength to keep fighting the devil when you go to the next war. Well, that's the problem with people is that they don't look for it. So I think that you're, you're becoming something else rather than Mr. Glad. I hope that you get to meet that special person today. Let's pray. Father God, please fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and wash away my sins with your holy blood. All this sermon is just going to be from you, Lord. Uh, everything that I've done and prepared is just weak and it's nothing. And all I need is Jesus Christ. And will you help me today? May people not lose their joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, let's look at the first one here is in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And uh, again, I say rejoice. Now, that's the first thing that I learned from Mr. Glad is to always be thankful and to always praise the Lord. Now, the thing is, when we go through hard times and problems, it's so easy to go through it and to feel it and to think about it. And usually what comes out of our mouth is actually whining or complaining or weariness. But when's the last time you said, thank you, Lord? You know, uh, when I met Mr. Glass, I was telling him a lot of my problems that, you know, it's too hard. A lot, I go through these difficult things to serve the Lord and I don't know why the Lord let these bad things happen to me and why I have to face this all out in this extremely difficult time. And then I told Mr. Glad, you know, I've seen you going through the same things and you're going through worse things than me, actually. You've been beaten with whip. You've been whipped, actually, and then you've been shipwrecked and uh, you've been uh, wandering here and there without a home over your head. Uh, I don't hear a single thing out of your mouth and Mr. Glad instead of thinking about the, the pains of the whipping that he's feeling in his back right now, or he just suffered a shipwreck and he's without a home, he just says, well, you know, I just uh, thank the Lord that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. How come I never heard you say that? And then Mr. Glad said, you know, I'm so thankful that I know that no matter how many times I mess up, he'll guide the path that I'm taking. I don't know why you never said that. You know, me and Mr. Glad went through some bad uh, weathers together, and, you know, I'm speaking uh, hypothetically, obviously, as like a story. But please follow along with me and uh, humor me for a while. So the thing is, when I, 
when I and Mr. Glad went through the storm together, I was the first one when I said, oh man, it's raining, it's going to ruin our event. But Mr. Glad was the one that says, thank you, Lord, this place finally could use some refreshment. I was the one when we went through hot weather and then uh, it was like over 100 degrees outside. And I was like, man, this is so hot. I don't, uh, I don't know what we're going to do now. I don't think we can fellowship outside. Everything's pretty much ruined. And Mr. Glad was the one that said, man, thank the Lord for good air condition, man. I know back in the first centuries, they didn't have that. Man, thank God for good air condition over here. I don't know why you're not thankful for your air condition. You got it covered. I was the one when we went through hot weather where I was complaining about the hot weather and Mr. Glad said, man, praise the Lord that you're the one that's got a roof over your head. Me, I know that I have to keep trying to find a shade and whenever I try to find a shade, I say, thank you, Lord, for this shade. I don't know why you never thank God for the shade over your head. You know what the problem was between me and Mr. Glad? My problem was I kept looking for something bad. And because of that, that's why I complained and whined. And I wasn't very happy in life because when there's painful things that happen, suffering or bad things that happen, I talk about them. I look at those things. Mr. Glad, he never looked at them one time. He just kept looking at the good. That's why he was so happy. Usually people who are so happy are those that don't look at the flooding that happens in their home or that the sleepless night that they went through because of a family squabble that they went through the day before. But usually the people are those that are happy who went through the family squabble, who may have went through a flooding in their home, but then they're just looking at the blessings that they have in their home and say, thank you, Lord, that at least the flood didn't reach that high, that I'm homeless. Thank you so much, Lord, that uh, at least I got some sleep tonight. Thank you so much, Father, that there are so many people outside on the streets that uh, don't have a nice pillow or a comfortable bed. Me, I have a nice bed. I don't know why I never thank God for that one time. You know, it's so easy uh, to be sad. People can have the most comfortable bed in the world and still be sad. You know why? All they have to do is find something bad. What is it? You might have the most expensive bed. It might be a water bed. It might be a feather bed. It might be a beautiful bed. It might be a bed that might be uh, like uh, 12 feet, 13, 13 feet, 14 feet, uh, long, wide, and etc. And then you can still complain and be sad. Why? Because I didn't get, still get a good night's sleep. But then you don't think about that expensive bed that you got that other people don't have, in, even in this church. Some of you got a job. Some of you got friends. Some of you got money. Some of you got blessings that other people don't have. And you're not enjoying them. Instead, you're still trying to find something bad to complain about with the current blessings that you have. You know, it's, rather than thanking God for a great church when so many people don't have churches and you've been to a lot of flimsy churches and apostate churches, you never thank God or been grateful or praise the Lord and look forward to coming to a church. Instead, you find something bad about it. You find something wrong with the preacher or the person or the event or the weather. You know how you look forward to a church service? You get thankful for it. You look for the good in it. You keep looking for the bad. Guess what? You will find the bad. You can get the cleanest house in the world and dust everything. But guess what? If you're looking for something bad, guess what? You will find that little piece of dust in the corner that you overlook. And that's why you become sad. You become miserable and depressed. Why? You aren't thankful or praising the Lord and happy with how much good God has given to you. You know, I'm so, uh, you can see me that I'm very tired right now, but uh, because I didn't get much sleep and I had... Uh, I had to go through some things, but I look forward to coming to church rather than dreading it. Why? Because even if there's problems in church, what do I do? I don't look at the bad. I look at the good. Thank you, Lord, for the hymn singing. I can't wait to do that. Thank you, Lord, for uh, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. I look forward to the fellowship behind it. Even people who have flawed personalities, I look at the good behind it, and I say, thank you, Lord, that this person and this sister is a blessing to me in this area. See, that's the thing. Then you become happy with the person, with the people, with the church, and everything around you. You're happy with your work situation, school situation, your family situation, everything you got in life. It's so easy to complain and whine and to be sad about the children you have, the parents you have, and the siblings that you have. Why can't you thank God you got one? 
There are so many people whose fathers have died, mothers have died, children have died. You know, why not be thankful and happy for what you have? You know, you don't, uh, then you, uh, you can't, you know what you do is that when you thank the Lord and you're truly grateful and you enjoy all the good that God has given to you, you become happy. But you're not truly thankful. You just say, thank you, Lord, for the food as a habit. Are you truly thankful? Are you truly happy for the food that you got? Don't you remember some days where you didn't have such good food? Or those lives and then those years that you were not getting as good food as you wanted? And then now you're living good food. You got money to eat out and enjoy and then you're not thankful? You're not truly thankful. You become happy. You be Mr. Glad. You become glad when you try to find something to be thankful for. To be truly happy about. Not just saying thank you, but truly what makes you happy and thankful for. When you keep searching for those things, you become happy. But when you keep trying to find something to complain about, critique about, and whine about, and be sad about, you become sad. Let's look at verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. You know, the reason why Mr. Glad is always Mr. Glad is because he lives in moderation. He doesn't live controlled. What is moderation? Moderation is when you have things in your life or you're doing things in your life, you're doing it moderately. You're not being controlled by it. You know, uh, when I was with Mr. Glad, and obviously I'm speaking as a story, I'm not saying that me or he did this before, but, you know, I was getting into uh, video games and social media chats and then television, and uh, I just can't wait for the next new season that came out and they just want to play games, and the metaverse especially, I was so excited about that. When, when white Tom Cho was speaking about the metaverse, I just couldn't wait to take, I just couldn't wait to play, play those things, be in that kind of world. But what happened was, when I started to immerse myself into uh, that stuff and then spend hours and days, and that was my joy, that was my happy time, but I was still uh, grumpy grouchy, sad, especially when they ruined my game time, especially when, you know, I had to get up to go to work, especially uh, when I have to, uh, when I didn't have enough money to keep the bills going. So I was sad, but Mr. Glad didn't have any of that, you know. He just uh, had not much in his home. All he did was just read the Word of God and pray and then go to church. And then I was like, uh, what makes you so happy, you know? And then Mr. Glad told me, you know, what makes you so sad? What makes you so depressed? Why are you always so tired? Why are you always not without energy? Why are you always grumpy? Me, I'm always happy. I don't know why are you like that. I was like, I don't know. Mr. Glad told me, well, you've been stuck in your room all day. That's why. You've been controlled by those electronics. And that's why your mood and then your personality and your conversation and everything became sour. And it felt like an effort and a work for you to go out and to talk to people and enjoy life out there. And that's why your relationships with your loved ones is also distancing apart. And you're having trouble sleeping at nights. I don't know why you have that. I don't. Why? Because I'm not bound by electronics, Mr. Glad said. I heard those electronics, they do something to your sleep patterns. You said you got health problems. You know, I don't have that because I go out often. You're always stuck at home. And then you, because of that, you get bad backs, bad shoulders, and then... You know, uh, your breathing uh, problems are bad, and et cetera. You say you have trouble sleeping? I don't. You keep daydreaming too much. Why? Because you keep playing with electronics. What's my point? This person right here playing games was not living moderately. Mr. Glad was. Why? He's not bound, dependent on it. Here's another example. You know, let's say that Mr. Glad, you know, uh, he's going through problems with his own spouse. And then me, I'm going through problems with my spouse. But Mr. Glad was always happy. And then me, I don't know, I always found it difficult. And then I told Mr. Glad, well, you don't understand my situation that I'm going. You know, I, I take care of a ministry, and then my spouse is struggling with this one and that one. And then it's hard to help that spouse to stay right with the Lord while at the same time I have to be balanced in my Christian walk, be charitable and understanding and patient with her as well, and then to correct myself. 
And then, I don't know, this spouse won't just live right for the Lord. And then Mr. Glad's like, well, I went through the same thing too. Yep. Actually, and then I'm like, well, why are you happy? And then he's like, you're so dependent on your spouse. You're controlled by that. Me, I, I'm not controlled by my spouse. If my spouse serves the Lord or doesn't serve the Lord, I'm, I know that what I'm depending on is Jesus Christ. Amen. I just do my part in trying my best and then to lead the family, lead her, and then pray, and then the Lord takes care of the rest. Amen. But when your spouse messes up on something, you think it's the end of the world. That's why some people who are in the ministries, they quit the ministry after their spouse dies. Why? They've been too dependent on that person. Not on Jesus Christ to build up the ministry. You know, you know how you be happy? You're not controlled and dependent on something that you find your source of joy into rather than Jesus Christ. Can I repeat that again? If there is something in this life that is outside of Jesus Christ, that is your source of joy and happiness, and when it's outside of Jesus Christ, then what happens is you become dependent on that thing. And then when bad things happen to that source of joy of yours, when it's outside of Jesus Christ, you think it's the end of the world. And you panic, you get angry, grouchy, worry, fearful, and then you become sad, miserable. You know how I keep this kind of crazy world going, the ministry going? I don't become dependent on people, on internet, on my family, or on my spouse. I'm dependent on Jesus Christ. And that's why I can maintain my joy, because I'm not controlled by other things. Neither should you. When you're controlled by money, guess what? You live a miserable life. Why? You keep looking at your app on the stocks and everything. You have to work extra hard in your workplace to get a promotion, a better pay. How sad and miserable of a life you are. Why? Because your source of joy is money. And because of that, you're controlled and dependent on that. Let me add this too so Brother Sean can get under conviction. It includes coffee too, brother. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, you know it's coming. Yeah, it's coffee, all right? Yeah, yeah it was coffee, all right? What happens if you become dependent and controlled by that? You can't enjoy a Sunday preaching, brother. <laughs> all right. But anyway, there is some serious note to, seriousness, though, to all of this. The point is you cannot, uh, you have to do things moderate. When, you're deep, uh, when you don't and you keep using those things to make you happy, what happens? You become dependent on those things to make you happy. And then what happens, it, it steals your joy when bad things happen. Shouldn't you just rely on Jesus Christ and that's it? Verse 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, uh, Mr. Glad also gave me another tip to make me happy, and that's, uh, I, I never understood him. You know, he went through a lot of problems. Uh, I went through major problems. Uh, I prayed to the Lord, you know, and then I still worry. I still sometimes go through sleepless nights. Mr. Glad, though, never had that problem, you know. I'm like, yeah, I'm going through right now a church split situation where the deacon is talking uh, bad and he got some people on his side and it's really bad. I'm about to lose the church right here. And Paul's like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, I went through three of those already. And I'm like, why are you so happy? And Paul said, well, I just prayed to the Lord. That's it. I'm like, well, I prayed to the Lord, too, and I still don't get it. And Paul's like, did you really pray to the Lord? I'm like, what do you mean by that? What's the original Greek behind that, Mr. Glad? I don't understand. What do you mean, really pray? And then he pointed out, you know, before you pray, it says, be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. You know what the problem with people is? Is this, is that you don't really, when you go through a bad time or a problem, you get so fearful and worried about the worst experience uh, the worst thing that can come out of it. And guess what you're doing? You're trying to find those bad things happening. And guess what? Those will happen then. 
Can I repeat that again? See, you're, when you keep searching for sad things, things to worry about, even though you're praying, you're praying to the Lord, but you keep searching for those bad things to happen, and guess what? They will happen. But if you keep trying and searching for the good on how God can use those bad things, because you surrendered it to prayer, and you know if God says yes, no, or wait, and you keep searching for the good in all of his answers in prayer, the worry just goes away. Especially when you think and believe that, you know, I believe God's ways is better than my way. I prefer, God, you do what, how you answer the prayer, not how I want the prayer to be answered. Because I'm scared when you answer the way that I want the prayer to be answered. Because I know if you answer it the way that I want it to be answered, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to face more hurt and pain. I like it when you go through your answers the way you want it to be answered through my prayer request. I prefer that, Father. See, when you truly believe in that and search and try to find the good on how God answers yes, no, and wait, especially with the previous prayers, you saw how God answered your prayers with no and wait. If you, if you look at the good behind that, if you remember that in your past, then what happens? The fear is gone. And you're not, and you know what you do? You, what you do in prayer is that you let it all go, the worries and the fears. You, sur you completely surrender it to prayer and you completely leave it in God's hand. And that's why the verse says in verse 7, and the peace of God, which what? Passeth what? All understanding. You know, the problem with people, why they live and dread and fear is they want to know. They want to know the result. They want to know. And it's like, if you are in the unknown, that gives a lot of fear and worry. What bad thing's going to happen? What, what's going to happen after I pray? And, you know, that's your problem. You want to know, and that's what gives you the comfort. No, that's not how peace works. It passeth all understanding from your understanding. And that, you know what I want? You know all you need to know and understand? All you need to know and understand is God, when he answers yes, no, and wait, it works. And it's better than the way that you want it to be answered. That's all I need to know. And then I'm just happy. I'm just so happy. I, I, I don't live in fear. I don't live in problems. What if those problems happen tomorrow? Who cares? You already let it go to prayer. Amen. Now that's God's problem. Let him worry and handle it. Amen. Oh, God must be so worried on what to do with your problem. Why not let it go? Well, what if you lose a church? Lose a church. If you get your church back, get, you're going to get your church back. Yeah. Who cares? The point is God's going to give you what is best. And I believe in his promise. I believe he won't give me a temptation greater than I can bear. And I believe that his way is better than the way that I want it to be answered. And I can just let it go. And then I just get happy. Pastor, this bad thing's going to happen in church. And this thing, what are we going to do about this problem? But just pray about it. And then guess what? You'd be surprised 90% of the time, sometimes those bad things don't even happen. Amen. And even if 90, can I say this? Even if 90% of the time those bad things happen, guess what? God's way is better than your way, and you're going to see that. And you're going to be thankful, and you're going to get peace. You get no peace if God answers every prayer that you want it to be answered. Trust me, you will get no peace. And that's why I can become Mr. Glad when I try to find something good and beneficial to how God answers yes, no, and wait. And usually when I do that, I find something in myself that needs fixing. Or God's trying to teach me something. Verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, that's how we go when we go through the list. All right, all right, all right, all right. I get it, I get it. No, you don't get it. That's your problem. You know, you're, you know why you're sad? You keep thinking sad stuff. You keep looking at bad stuff, finding bad stuff, uh, 
What's this infatuation with the world that in news they want to see some bad news or tragic news or scary news? What's this infatuation with that nowadays? You know, that, that's what your mind inclines to. It's stuck in. It's not thinking about true, honest. You know, when you think about, oh, money's running out and how am I going to pay my next bill and my meal? Hey, is that, uh, is that whatsoever things are lovely to think about? Or maybe when the money runs out, is it better to think about, you know what, uh, let's not think about those bills. I already prayed to the Lord and gave it up to him. Why don't I just go outside in the woods over there and enjoy the nice weather that God has given to me? I, when's the last time I thought about that? Let's go do that. That's what's thinking on whatsoever things are lovely. You know, whatsoever things are true. The point is, you have to think happy thoughts. And then you become happy thoughts itself. That's what happened. But see, you keep thinking about bad stuff, critical stuff, negative stuff, complaining stuff. That's why you become that person. And trust me, if you keep thinking that, it will become that. If you think tragedy, it will become tragedy. When you try to think that there is something evil, anything out there, you will see evil. But when you think about something good that the Lord can do out of it, when you think about something, uh, how God will bless your life and uh, make you happy, then what happens? Then uh, you become that. You know, I guarantee you this, a lot of you are sitting on at least a hundred blessings of God, Amen. but uh, you're not seeing that. That's good. You're not feeling that or even thinking or believing. You're not becoming that. Why? You put it, you wasted it. You became depression. You became complaining. You became sadness. You became anger. You became fear. That's what you became. Why? Because you kept thinking those things. You never thought about something honest, lovely, just, pure. Even when you're in a rundown situation, bad position in life, can't you just think and look at the beautiful things that the Lord has given to you and start enjoying them? Can't you do that? You can live in a rundown home, but if you have a wonderful spouse and wonderful children who support you, why can't you start looking at those things and enjoying fellowship with them rather than complaining about the rundown house? And if you have a messed up family but a very nice house, why can't you be thankful for the nice bedroom, the nice living room, and the nice house that you got rather than just keep looking at the flaws in your family? You know what my point is? You don't think the happy things that God has currently given to you and you don't enjoy them. All you think about is the bad stuff that you find. That was the difference between Mr. Glad and me. And then instead of finding problems in my church, problems with my church people, problems with my uh, family, problems with my spouse, problems with the internet ministry, I just, uh, instead of thinking all these bad things, why can't I think about, look at the fruits of the souls they got saved. Look at these people who, are, uh, who have spiritually grown so much for the Lord and done things for the Lord. Look at how the church has successfully evaded attack after attack after the, after the devil. Look at the miracles God has given to this church he did not give to any other church. Why can't you think like that? That's why you're sad. That's why you're miserable. You don't think on all these good things God has given to you. If you try to find the good that God has given to you and think about them, rather than those negative, worry thoughts when you're sleeping at the middle of the night, when the devil tempts me with, you know, what if this problem happened? You know what I do automatically with my mind? You know, I can't wait for uh, tomorrow church when we sing hymns. That's what I do. Well, you're going to face that problem in the church maybe. And then I was like, you know, you want me to sing hymns, Satan? You know, I can't wait to sing those songs. I can't, I can't wait to sing the song. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burden down. And I'm smiling. And the devil's like, be sad, be sad. And, I, and then I might say to the devil, I think you're sad. I think you're worried you're going to fry in hell for eternity. You just want me to be sad as you. You know, that's your problem. You need to think these things and you become happy. Uh, verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, 
and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, uh, that's the simple thing is that I learned all these tips from Mr. Glad and I'm writing it down and I'm the one that attended Mr. Glad's preaching that day and I sat at the same seat that you sat and I was hearing all these things from Mr. Glad and I was writing the notes and, you know, I went on the altar after he preached and I got right with the Lord and I was like, Mr. Glad, thank you, that's some good stuff. And then, but you know, the very next week I was still sad. But Mr. Glad, he was still happy. And I'm like, I don't get it. You know, I, I just heard the preaching. I don't know why I'm sad. And Mr. Glad said, uh, did you apply and actually did the concepts that you learn on the preaching about how not to worry, how to pray properly, how to become happy, how to think happy thoughts? And did you, did you do that? Did you do that? Well, I know, I, I no, no, did you do that? Why don't you tell me step by step that problem? Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, what happened today was that my, my son would not listen to me that day. And I tried to tell my son on how to live right. And my daughters won't listen to me. They think that I'm strict and I'm a hard parent. And then, uh, and then, uh, the, and then Mr. Glad told me, you notice what happened right there? Why you're not happy? Why? I don't get it. You, were, you weren't thinking happy thoughts. You never told me one time a happy thought that you thought of. You know, I never heard prayer there. Yeah. You never mentioned to me that you stopped and prayed. You just went by an emotional response as soon as something bad happened. And you did those things. Can I repeat that again? That'll be eye-opening. When something bad happens, the very first reaction is the flesh to react and to accept it and to respond to it. If a depressing things happen, the first reaction of the flesh is to accept that depressing thing, think that depressing thing, feel that depressing thing, and say and do those depressing things. You know what you should have done when that bad thing happened? First reaction is not to feel it, think it, or do it. You need to do, do what? Think on these things, happy thoughts. Do what? Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Do what? Rejoice in the Lord always. Isn't life great? Look at all these wonderful things you got. You know, that's your problem. That's your problem. You don't do them. No, you don't do them. You say you do, but you don't. You know what you do first? You do depression first, complaining first, whining first, pain first. That's what you do first. You don't do these happy things first. Then I was like, wow, Mr. Glad, that was deep stuff. And Mr. Glad's like, what do you mean deep stuff? Didn't the Bible already tell you a long time ago, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self? That's why you think Romans 8, 28 don't, no longer works. That's why you don't believe 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And you keep saying, I try, I try. No, you didn't try. When, I, when you told me all the detail what you did in your life, you weren't really trying. See, you can't just, uh, you can't just uh, try all these glad things. It's more of being glad. When you be happy, be glad, you do them. And if you keep doing these happy things, you can become happy, vice versa. How can I be Mr. Glad? You do them, but you're not doing them. It's that simple. You know what you, your flesh wants to do? Your flesh wants to be sad, happy, cry, whine, complain. That's what it wants to do. All right, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You know, one thing I also uh, learned from Mr. Glad is, uh, you know, he, he wasn't unstable. That's one thing about Mr. Glad that I noticed. Mr. Glad, uh, there were times that uh, he was able to have enough money to go on a nice vacation trip to uh, France, England, and etc., and then there were times that Mr. Glad was also homeless and had no place to go to. But he was always, you know, the same, no matter what situation uh, he was in. And then myself, me, I was always sad and I was always depressed. 
I was like, you know, I don't get it. Uh, why are you always uh, content? That's one thing I noticed about you. You're always content. Because Mr. Glad said, well, the reason why uh, I'm able to practice contentment is that I don't have a, something that I keep desiring. So when there's this constant desire of, I want this, or I need this, I want this to happen. I want this bad thing to go away. I want that. And then when you go by wants, guess what? You're living your life by your wants, and you know God does not operate by what you want. If you let those things go and fully surrender to the Lord, Lord, I surrender all whatever your way is best, and then you can start to be content with what God has given to you. You know, uh, the thing, why is uh, Mr. Glad able to be content? Because then he'll never be satisfied if he's not content. Let me tell you something dangerous. If you don't have contentment, you'll never enjoy life. And you'll never learn what satisfaction is like. You, once, once the person tastes that drug, what happens? Then they feel that satisfaction, and then they keep going for it. And then when they keep going for that, they don't sa taste that same satisfaction. That's the thing about people is that they, uh, once you have something good in life, just be thankful for what you have and learn to try to enjoy them and use them. Why? If you don't do that, you're going to seek after more, and you're going to waste the current rewards and the blessings God has given to you. You ever seen these children? You're, you grown adults are like children, children who wanted a new toy, and they got it finally. So they should be happy with the new toy they got, but it's been three years, and they don't care about that new toy anymore. Now they want a different toy. You know, God has blessed you already with what you wanted, even what you wanted. He gave you a love in your life that you wanted, a home that you wanted, a, a life that you wanted, a, a, the pay that you wanted, or goals that you wanted and God gave it to you, and you're still not happy? You know what your problem is? I'll tell you what your problem is. See, you've gotten used to those things. You, you're not content. You've got to make it always something as if, man, I need to hold on and enjoy this because I know it's not going to last. One day it's going to go away. And guess what? That's inevitable in life. Good things do go away one day. Why can't you enjoy what God has given to you right now? Be, be content. Be content. That's why in verse 12 it says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And that's the thing about uh, the next thing I want to talk about, Mr. Glad's contentment stage. Uh, not only was he able to enjoy what he has and stay in that state of contentment, there's a reason why he's able to stay that way. And I'm like, you know, Mr. Glad, I don't get it. What is your secret here? You know, you're happy when you went to that long vacation trip up to France and you did a trip throughout Europe, and then you're still happy when you don't go on a trip and you're stuck out on the streets without a roof over your head. I don't get it. Why are you still glad? Why are you still happy? And Mr. Glad told me, because I, ex I experienced everything in life. I went through what it's like to enjoy uh, traveling around the world and going to nice places. And I've also learned what it's like to be without a place. So that's the reason why I realized, you know, it doesn't matter good or bad that I go through. I'm just happy with what I have. Yes. And you might go, I don't understand that. No, you'll understand that. Uh, I didn't understand that until I went through it. Until I went through pain and happiness, then I knew that no matter where I went through in life, whether it's a painful day or a happy day, it's just the same day. It's just the same day. Let me just enjoy life. You might say, I don't understand that. I'll tell you the reason why. You keep running. You never went through bad and good together. You always kept trying to run away from the bad and try to keep chasing after something good in life. And you're still doing that. And that's why you're sad and miserable. You know what content is? Content is whether bad or good comes to you, you just take it. Amen. You just take it and learn to enjoy life. 
You can never enjoy life when you keep trying to run, or run away from something bad and try to find something good. Then you'll be an endless search and journey, especially when that bad thing happens and you can't run away from those things. Let's see how happy you are after that. Why not just let bad times, good times come to you and then be happy? That's something that you don't understand until you learn to overcome pain, until you learn to face pain in the face. When I went through so many painful things, what happened? I got used to it. I got used to it. Not only that, I've learned to let it just flow down my back and to just overlook it. And then I've learned to see more beauty and enjoyable things in life. And then I've learned how to try to be happy during painful times. And guess what? It was the same thing during my happy times without pain. It was the same thing. Just enjoy and be happy no matter what situation you go through. But in order to attain that, you need to accept pain first. That's your problem. You need to have that acceptance and that willingness to accept and to confront pain. And if you keep running away from that pain, guess what? You'll still keep doing that for the rest of your life and you'll never be happy. The only way you'll be happy is that you face pain right in front of the face and accept it, railroad through it. And what happens is, this is even biological too, your fleshly responses get used to it, immune to it. And it's just, it's just the same old, same old. That's it. And then not only that, you learn to find contentment with what you have and truly enjoy the good things that you do have. But guess what? If you keep fearing pain and run away from pain, Guess what? One day pain will come. You can't run away. It will happen. And let's see you be happy after that. Why not? If I were you, I want to be happy now. Not keep searching for happiness. God already gave you happiness. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And that's another thing that I've learned from uh, Mr. Glad is to... Uh, how you can be happy is that, look, no matter what bad things happen in life, I can do anything. And that's the thing with people is that, uh, you know, when they go to a new job or new phase in life, you start in a church or a new thing in school, it can be a dreadful thing, fearful thing, and then they go through problems that they never thought that would happen before. And they get sad and miserable. They get unconfident in their own abilities too. Uh, even people who've done it for years can be unconfident and scared. And, you know, as a Bible-believing pastor, I still do that. And that's why there's worry, fear, depression, rather than true happiness. You know how you get happy? You truly believe you can do everything in Christ. I can do it. Well, guess what? Uh, you, you know you, uh, your exam, it's so hard. Let's say you're a young person. You're going to take an exam and you can't pass and you're unable to overcome it. And you study your best, but you can't do this. And you know you're going to get in trouble and you're not going to get that uh, A that you want and et cetera. Look, I can do all things through Christ. I've tried my best. Why don't I just do it for the Lord? But why are you still scared after that? You know why? You're afraid of the mistake that you'll make. And then you say, well, I don't doubt God's power, but I know myself. I keep making mistakes. <laughs> hey, hey, do you think God uses perfect people or God uses people who makes mistakes? And do you think that promise, I can do all things through Christ, is only for perfect people or people who make mistakes and they need Christ so that they can do all things? You know what your problem is? You don't believe that when you make the mistake that God can make something out of that. Well, I thought that I can do all things through Christ and then I don't get that A that I wanted. You don't believe God can use your F for something good. To make something good out of you. You know, that's your problem. You freak out. You don't believe that, uh, well, I don't know how I can uh, keep my family together, my life together. I mean, me as a pastor, as a church together, or as a husband, the father... Uh, to, to keep the home together. I can't do that. I've had people and children who leave me and I tried my very best and I prayed and I acted and I led and, and you know, I, I, I know I can do all things through Christ and you keep telling me that I can do it, but, you know, uh, I make mistakes and I've made mistakes and I shouldn't have said things I shouldn't have said and then there are problems that happen in the household. Hey, you know, that's your problem. 
those mistakes, you don't believe God can use those things. You don't believe the story God can bring the prodigal back home. You don't believe that God can use bad situations for a better valuable lesson for you. You don't believe that those mistakes that you used is for your betterment. You don't believe that God is a God of miracles, that he always does something when you thought it's too late. That's your problem. It doesn't say I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. It says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Why does it say which? Because what strengthens you when you went through everything through Jesus Christ and did all those things through Christ, even the mistakes. And those things strengthen you to become a better person. How do I draw like that, write like that, teach like that? Tons and tons of, ugh, I, I don't like a whiteboard. I can't do this. I don't know how they do this, but I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Oh, you misspelled the word over there. And oh, who are you? Who do you think you are? And guess what now? It strengthened me. And people go, how do you draw like that? How do you teach like that? I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do it either. But it's because... I can do all things. I did those things. You didn't. When I did those things through Christ, it strengthened me. So why you make a mistake? Go out and make a mistake. Just try your best. Be humble and repent and tr start over. And then make it empower you. You know why people are afraid to do new things in life and cannot be happy and always get scared about... Hey, pastor wants you to do something. No, no, I can't do a good job in that one. You know what your problem is? See, your problem is, is that uh, you don't want to make mistakes. That's your problem. Make the mistake, and I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Uh, the last thing, so I know that time's up. Verse 19, let me wrap it up here. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know why I can become Mr. Glad? I can be happy. Because in the end, the, I look at how many times God has rewarded and blessed me after all the pain and the trials and the hurt and the years that I lived for him. I've seen too many miracles in my life. And I've seen God, after the pain, what blessing and what fruit he brought. That's why I can be happy. You know why Mr. Glad is Mr. Glad, why Paul is so happy? Because it is out of those beatings he saw souls got saved. He saw the blessing after that. It is out of those things that he thought he would lose his ministry that God planted more ministries after that. He saw God's blessings. That's why he's happy. And that's why when a new pain happens, Mr. Glad's like, it's the same old Lord. I just go through it. And I know that I can't wait for the blessing that's just around the corner. You're going to give me a good blessing. You're going to reward me. And guess what happens once you get the blessing and reward? Those years of pain soon get forgotten because you're just too immersed on too much good. You know, do you think it's a burden and a pain for me? I mean, sometimes it was when I discipled and trained people over here in my church. And then it was like, oh, man, this burden, that burden. But you know what? When I look at the fruits, how God empowered these people and used them now in my church, and not only that, they're helping me in my church so much, and they were the ones that prayed for me and been there for me when other people weren't, I forgot the pain that I went through with them. I was like, man, it was, those years were worth it. Those years I've been patient and loving, put up and tr discipled and trained and tr did my best. Now they're doing more good than all the bad they did that throughout those past years. That's what happens in heaven. All, all it takes is one person, <laughs> it's so funny, per Christian goes up to heaven, I am so angry at you, Jesus. And God goes, Bleep. here's your reward. And you go, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love you so much. That's what happens. That's why you become Mr. Glad. And you don't let pain and sadness, depression, and misery dominate your life. Uh, look at the blessings. Why don't you look at your blessings? The sad thing is this, is that... This happened to me sometimes when Mr. Glad kept saying all these happy things and tried to help me out. You know, there was a point that he just made me sick and tired and I didn't believe him. And Mr. Glad's like, look, I'm trying to be your friend. I'm trying to help you. And I was like, no, I don't want you anymore. 
uh, I got my own thing. Oh, you tried, but it just doesn't work. I tried, and I know you're trying, but it just doesn't fit me. And then what happened was, then I tried to find Mr. Glad again, and he wasn't there, and I'm like, where is he? Then I met another person, and I was like, who are you? And the guy's like, you know, isn't God not good? You know, don't bad things happen in your life? Life is so miserable. And I'm like, man, I don't want you as my friend. You're just making me feel more depressed. And then, what's your name, I said. And his, he told me, my name is Mr. Sad. And I heard that you wanted me. So your previous friend, Mr. Glad, told me, you know, he doesn't want me anymore. He wants you. So here am I with you. Let's cry in a rock together. And boy, was I crying with Mr. Sad. And I was so depressed. I was like, I don't want you. Where's Mr. Glad? You can't find them again. Sometimes sadness can overwhelm you so much to a point you won't find Mr. Glad again. And that's the sad thing. Why? Because you keep pushing him away. Keep him while you still have him. 